Sega Streets of Race Trilogy 1, 2, and 3, circa 1991, 92, and 94 respectively, known by many to be one of the most widely acclaimed beat-em-up franchises of all time. And for those curious why, stop wondering, cause here we go. First off, forgive the 4-5 to five month absence due to that infamous COVID-19 global pandemic and other personal affairs best not mentioned at this juncture. That being said, I'm dedicating this long-awaited review to the following. Brooklyn Interactive Group and Somerville Media Center, Boston Open Screen, made up of Atwood, Healy, Van Voorhees, and others, Mike Lindquist from Wayland, The Letterman Family, made up of Henny, Mel, and Gloria, oh, and the late great Marty, Michelle One from Newton Highlands, and her pet Chewy, Cambridge Community TV, Belmont Media Center, Arlington Community Media Incorporated, Hawk Commercial Photography and Filmmaking, Rango Studios and Catalyst Comedy, James Rolfe and Mike Mitzay from Cinemassacre, Bitbar Salem, and soon Malden, Java Slovakia, the Mount Vernon Kid, Blasphemous HD, Girl with the Yellow Spoon from LA, and Plum Drop 11 from Tewksbury, Boston 8 Bit, Tryheart Made Up of Jubinski, aka Biffle Cup, Prior, aka Diamond Machine, and Ozil, aka Astrologic, Geek Beat Radio, Pete Haggerty, aka Robot Sex Music, Aaron Hickman, aka Daya, and 8 Bit Eric Perez from San Antonio, Texas, Amber Hughes Care Voxney from Indiana, Michelle, aka Autumn, Lee Bales, aka Old School Gamer Mama from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, X Bit Gaming, Boston District 8 City Councilor Kenzie Bach, and finally, Jess Alimo from Cookie Time in Arlington, and Lauren Pespisa from Renters Radio. Anyways, with those out of our system, and taking a huge nosedive into the main premise, a shadowy enterprise referred to as the Syndicate, run under the iron-fisted leadership of the mysterious Mr. X, has not only overtaken a nameless, once jovial urban cityscape, but has managed to buy out its police force, thereby making all the authorities corrupt under their rule, as well as threatening the balance of society in the fucking process. Just when all seemed lost, however, a trio of ex-cops have arisen from said societal wreckage – Adam Hunter, Axel Stone, and Blaze Fielding – all with the intent of turning the tables on the endless hordes of syndicate gangs and restoring their currently plagued city to its former glory without any rest in sight. In terms of gameplay, who'd expect anything less than a boredom-free, no-holds-barred streetwise beat-em-up akin to the ill-fated Technos Japan's Double Dragon franchise, Renegade, and especially Capcom's Final Fight, and two other Sega heavy hitters, namely Golden Axe and Alien Storm, within which you start off your long, hard Metropolitan Massacre as either one or two of the three vigilantes. Stats-wise, while Adam's slow in speed and proficient in attack, with Blaze traveling much faster and being slightly less proficient in attack, Axel's kind of an in-between regarding these key stats, despite his jump attack capabilities turning out to be for dick all as opposed to the others. Control-wise, the D-pad lets either one of the three migrate around to their heart's content, and by default, A, B, and C, which you can swap around in the options screen beforehand here and in 3, but not in 2, lets them summon a police car with two other faithful backup X-Cops, busting out either a bazooka or a rocket launcher, thereby making every surrounding adversary their eternal bitches in no time flat, but only in this game, perform normal attacks as well as nab any nearby items and or weapons, and jump, respectively. Other techniques include, but aren't limited to, character-specific attacks performed via B and C simultaneously, specifically Adam with his super jump kick, Axel with his backhand punch, and Blaze with her standing roundhouse. Combos resulting in either epic-ass techniques including elbow smashes, head slams, backflips, overhead and shoulder slams, back drops and vaults, and most importantly, consider this a heads up. Whenever you're being slammed by an enemy, use up and C simultaneously to recover yourself, thereby alleviating any resulting fall damage. Regarding the types of weapons you can use, found in random foam booths, waste baskets, you name it, or wielded by numerous adversaries, there's bottles, knives, baseball bats, lead pipes, and pepper shakers to distract said adversaries, thereby earning yourself the upper hand. Take note that they'll disappear upon taking damage way too many times while wielding any of them. You can even recover your life energy with apples and chicken, add more points with gold bars and cash bags, and at rare instances, snatch extra lives, represented by miniaturized, or chibi-fied if you will, versions of the entire trio, and cop cars for an extra use of the backup squad summoning tactic, of which you're only allowed one per stage. There are eight stages in total, all of which you must brave in order to fulfill your vigilante voyages to not only take the law into your own hands, but to suppress the sustaining shitstorm of the Syndicate's oppressive rule, filled to the brim with one relentless gang of hoodlums after another. 
Standard punks by the name of Garcia, sly kicking slamming mohawk sporting punks by the name of Yellow Signal, whip toting dominatrixes by the name of Nora, stealthy kung fu practitioners by the name of Hakuo, by whom Mr. X's right hand main chief is inspired by the way, and especially circus style juggling punks with hatchets and torches by the name of Jack, all of whom you'll be confronting very motherfucking often. And notice how the timer resets every time you eliminate every wave per scenery range. The streets, inner city alleys, beachfront, the under construction highway, aboard a cruise ship, the syndicate HQ's industrial factory, its freight elevator above the cityscape, and finally its top floor inner sanctum. Oh, and about the bosses guarding those very areas, let's just say they'll drive your ass up the goddamn wall faster than those backup squad cars every time you summon them and Sonic himself combined if your senses aren't in top form. Granted, both titles were out the same year, I digress. The Italian boomerang wielding punk Antonio, the gruff Wolverine lookalike Salver, the merciless high energy wrestler Abadede, aka whom I like to call the discount ultimate warrior, Bongo, the corpulent shit for brains fire breathing lard ass douche who looks like he's ripped straight out of Data East Karnov, in fact, the bastard child of the aforementioned Karnov and bulk from Power Rangers, the acrobatic and dexterous green suited blaze decoys, namely Mona and Lisa, aka Yasha and Onihime in the Japanese version, and finally, the devious machine gun toting Mr. X himself. Seriously, if most of you think I'm exaggerating or blowing smoke up anyone's asses when I accentuate how imperative it is to be fully aware of your enemy's habits and make every effort to bypass any unnecessary damage or hazards like in every other friggin' beat-em-up out there, obviously, consider yourselves gravely mistaken. Hell, at least the controls are receptive and solid, as many might expect, in spite of the slight delay of certain techniques depending on which character role you're assuming, over which I'm in no mood to beat a dead goddamn horse, ditto for the rather redundant yet essential gameplay framework and mechanics, and that's no fucking shit either. In regards to Streets of Rage's challenge, depending on not only the difficulty mode you set beforehand, or more to the point the characters you experiment with, hence the playstyles many rely on, which won't be repeated at this juncture, but mainly how you acclimatize yourself with every necessary key component this beat-em-up has to offer, you'll either have a somewhat invigorating time, or a shitty, harrowing one from which there's no chance of breaking away. Therefore, I'd make every effort to avoid the latter. For starters, getting the basic gist of performing the necessary combos on your attackers and knowing when to recover from an enemy throw is mere fucking child's play compared to everything else, not to mention experimenting with the different weapons that deal way more damage than the X-Cops themselves despite the slight delay that occurs when executing an attack, in which case, plan them accordingly. And whenever there's more than one weapon in range, you're better off sticking with one for a while before experimenting with the other. Whatever you do, never fumble around with multiple weapons, especially when you're surrounded by incoming punks, I might add, because the chances are higher than the Fox Plaza building in Century City, LA, that you'll get your ass handed back to you in a goddamn griddle. Likewise, if you inadvertently fall into any of the highway pits or off the fucking freight elevator. Also, when mobilizing the backup squad car for the most intense situations, whether it's the aforementioned enemy crowding or during the end boss confrontations, keep that usage to a reasonable minimum unless you've snatched yourself another mini squad car. And since this very benefit is only only available in the first seven stages, don't expect the same luck in the Syndicate HQ as you'll have to rely on your own wits and brawn when you engage in repeat encounters with the same gang of bosses from earlier before reaching Mr. X. Speaking of whom, upon reaching that motherfucking bigwig son of a bitch bastard, you're asked whether or not you want to join him. For those that recall what I stated in my Gargoyles quest review alongside Ghosts and Goblins and Ghosts and Ghosts from four years ago, do yourself an enormous favor and pick no before the epic showdown, cause picking yes will result in your ass getting booted back to the goddamn industrial factory two stages ago. If you're playing in two player mode and end up with different answers, you'll end up having no other choice but to fight each other until either one of you comes out on top and go through the same routine as if you've reached this point alone. Considering my familiarity with the variety of ensuing outcomes, however, I'm in no position to spoil them, in which case I strongly suggest playing for yourself. Starting out with three lives, more of which can be acquired by AGAIN, racking up rare 1-ups and scoring extra points, and three continues, don't get too discouraged should any situation turn out to be one repugnant clusterfuck after another, especially when, say, a random punk appears out of nowhere as a distraction during the boss confrontations. Did I forget to mention how much one wishes the contrasting areas and enemy lineup would have stood out more taking the 16-bit console's limitations into account? On the graphical forefront, the presentation's a mix of pluses and minuses, especially for a 16-bit beat-em-up hailing from the same year as the first Sonic, Jewel Master, Golden Axe 2, the aforementioned Alien Storm, Fantasy Star 3, the infamous Heavy Nova and Back to the Future 3, World Rash, and we all know where the Christ this is going, running on a 4-bit mega cartridge, no less. 
While every urban background is diverse and immaculate, rife with multiple layers, if in some cases just one, and set pieces, and especially the liveliest and near-realistic environmental details one can feast their eyes on for god knows how long, they tend to overstay the ever-loving fuck out of their own precious yet limited welcome, that is until you reach every end boss. The participating cast of characters, protagonists and antagonists alike, all have their defining moments. The in-game avatars of the former, while less detailed and genuine in stark contrast to their appearances in the opening and ending sequences, not to mention being slightly more dwarfing in comparison to Cody Hagar and Guy from Final Fight, are the very least true to life and alluring in how they physically express themselves on the playing fields. And the less I say about the latter, aka the also diverse, albeit redundant opposing cadres of hostile parties, low on the choppy-ass 30 frame per second in-game background scrolling, except for the aforementioned opening title sequence and the text-based stage intros, the better. But at least they're slightly taller and more aggressive than the main trio of vigilantes, not counting the Blaze clones, of course. In terms of music and sound, composed immaculately by the acclaimed Yuzo Koshiro, with the character voice samples also performed by him regardless of gender. And for more information on him, refer back to my Revenge of Shinobi Season 2 Finale Review, number 20, from half a decade ago. The FM-synthesized, techno-style, dancehall and club-inspired tunes never disappoint in the least, even after nearly 30 years, highlighting the game's most pivotal moments, of course. I wish I could say the same about the sound effects, about which I'm better off looking the other way despite how convincing some of them try to be, considering they were recycled straight from the earlier referenced Revenge of Shinobi, but definitely not the appropriately placed voice samples, as they add a sense of drama and hilarity at times. To each satisfying as hell triumphant defeat of every enemy, or during the vigorous technique executions and humiliating demises of your ex-cop. Well, before I go on any further, take note of the top 10 songs displayed here. Replayability-wise, in spite of lacking the same flair as its later sequels, not to mention sporting the same cliches as Final Fight, Double Dragon, Rival Turf, and the like, in terms of gameplay variety, and even the myriad of downsides that keep this game from reaching near-classic status, about which won't be echoed at this juncture, there's no reasonable as fuck doubt that you'll be endlessly kicking and screaming for more from the inescapable streets of rage. Ergo, there should be no goddamn excuse whatsoever to turn down this or its next two sequels at all. Exhibit B, Streets of Rage 2. M. Defala, you have the floor. Continuing directly from where its precursor left off, just when the three ex-cop turned vigilantes believed that their sworn rival was once and for all defeated, and the city was back to its normal state, Oh, how gravely mistaken they'd be! Not only has the unforeseen resurrection of Mr. X taken shape and place, he's even managed to shanghai the fuck out of Adam in an attempt to lure the remaining Axel and Blaze into yet another in the series of urban shitstorms. But not without the cooperation of two new combatants, namely Max Thunder, an ex-wrestler companion of Axel's, and the iconic Eddie slash Sammy Hunter, alias Skate, Adam's younger sibling, who've enlisted themselves to join them in yet again putting Mr. X's sadomasochistic ass the Christ out of commission. Talk about history repeating itself. In fucking deed. Now, if you care to voice your thoughts on the always stellar gameplay, It's all ditto just like the previous offering, but with an unprecedented shitload of much needed improvements. For starters, in terms of character stats, Axel and Blaze are back, with the former being built up more for attack power than agility, and the latter being well balanced in both areas. Whereas the newly introduced Max Thunder and Skate Hunter are considered to be on the slow side, despite packing way more damage inflicting techniques and throws than the others, 
and travel incredibly quick from one end of the stage area to the other despite lacking the crucial damage output in comparison to the rest. Respectively, the main four, of whom as ever you can play as either one or two, also sport a plethora of diverse movesets and special techniques, except minus the police squad car summoning tactic this time around, including but not limited to the same elbow smashes, head slams, aerial strikes, bat flips, overhead shoulder slams, backdrops, vaults, and damage alleviating post throw landing maneuvers. For those that recall my Mazen Saga review, the basic controls of A, B, and C, as I mentioned before, for pulling off health deducting special techniques, normal attacks and jumping individually, can't be swapped around in the option screen beforehand unlike in 1, and the soon to be discussed 3, but I digress. There's also blitz techniques at their disposal pulled off by tapping left or right twice and B thereafter. Max's Ultra Slide, Axel's titular bare knuckle, hence this franchise's alternate Japanese namesake, aka the Grand Upper, Blaze's Vertical Smash, and even Skate's Dynamite Headbutt, as well as their own A4 stated health deducting special maneuvers via A. The same array of weapons are back, except the Ninja Swords and Kunai Blades are added to the mix. Ditto for the grenades the bikers throw around in Area 2. Which, personally, up until now, I rarely ever use since they still go off regardless of one's instincts, in which case you're best off avoiding them like that still raging coronavirus outbreak, all of which, as ever, will disappear if you get hit too often while wielding them. Likewise for the health, recovery, sustenance, and rare one-up symbols, except they're not cheapified representations of the main characters. Fuck no. As always, there are eight stages in the entire campaign, but with a more augmented sense of diversity within them, considering how much effort the designers integrated towards these areas and how monotonous they turn out to be. If maybe a skosh, depending on the setting, of course. Not to mention the fact that there's three areas included, starting with the usual neon-filled inner city streets, followed by a near-decrepit bar and the rainy back alleys, a highway infested with onslaught after onslaught of armored biker punks, all named after natural wind disasters, complete with a confrontation within the back of a truck occurring in between, an amusement park followed by not only its nearby indoor arcade, but also both pirate themed and sci-fi themed, more like Geiger inspired, attractions. A baseball stadium complete with a pitcher's mound, doubling as a downwards only high speed elevator to an underground arena within the lower middle and upper decks of a cruise ship, a nearby beach and jungle path leading up to Mr. X's new syndicate HQ island penthouse, the usual factory area, followed by a trek aboard a massive conveyor belt, and lastly, the inner sanctum of the syndicate building itself, made up of its main lobby, ending with a long ass elevator ride. The main diverse cast of punks and perpetrators are back, not just the usual Garcia, renamed Galzia, and Signal Punks, but also the debut of the bald shirtless punks by the name of Donovan, unarmed and with either knives or pipes, complete with those earlier recounted armored bikers, buffed up Yakuza Karate Masters, stealthy ninjas, and even white high kickboxers named after birds and lizards. Joe Higashi, move over! <laughs> Likewise for the area-specific bosses, the knife maniacs, namely Jack, Bino, and Soya, those slutty-ass dominatrixes, Nora, Electra, Lightning Lisa, Sugar Q, and others. Dark wife beater clad Kempo Masters, namely Barbon, Wayne, and Vulture, with the former disguised as a fucking bartender, rocket propelled freaks, Jet, Comet, Spitfire, Mesquite, Blitz, Tomcat, Bomber, and many others. The Helix, a gargantuan as boss extraterrestrial behemoth that strikes only with his cranium. The return of Zamza, this time as a merciless, clawed, samurai like alien warrior, and his clones, namely Nail and Souther, as well as those obese, lard ass fire breathers, namely Big Ben, Big Go, Anri, Balloon, Bongo, you name it. And that discount ultimate warrior wannabe heavyweight fuckbat Gabadete and his two clones, Z and Kusano. Oversized cue ball heavyweight boxers, R Bear and Bear Jr., hopping robotic beings by the name of Particle and Molecule. And take note, you'll be confronting palette swapped versions of one or more of the same. Oh, and who could ever forget about the final showdown with Mr. X, except this time joined by his right-hand bodyguard Shiva, aka whom I like to call Liu Kang's long-lost cousin on LSD and acid. More than ever, I shit you not, with this diverse and massive as hell plethora of cold-hearted, brainless, piss-ant jerk-offs, it's no surprise that their impulses have dramatically changed, as a certain number of the latter indicated group can and will react to your physical offenses, for instance, blocking, dodging, countering, you name it. In which case, and forgive the paraphrasing in advance, I'd do whatever the fuck's necessary to grasp the best understanding of how their patterns work if I were you. Also, I wouldn't get too goddamn close to certain bosses as they'll fuck up your world worse than Marshall from Hangover 3, Walter Sobchak from The Big Lebowski, both more 
Marcellus Wallace and Butch from Pulp Fiction, Bartleby and Loki from Dogma, and even Losado from the infamous No Mercy combined. And trust us, we'll get back to some of them, the bosses that is, in no time flat. More to add, Lister? As opposed to the previous offering, and as many might expect, the controls still feel the same way, except minus any pointless ass split second delays before pulling off any crucial techniques, of which there are many, hence one of those much needed improvements I'm hinting at, in conjunction with the always constant gameplay framework, and the earlier hinted wide array of techniques, which can take an immense deal of experimenting on one's part, but aren't much of a bastard to get hooked on, and then some. You and me both, man. Your thoughts on this ever so celebrated sequels challenge? While it may appear to be on approximately the same plateau as in the first SOR, this often celebrated crown jewel of a follow-up has been jacked up like a motherfucker, difficulty-wise, despite being well-balanced. By that, I'm merely referring to the fact that the first two to three areas turning out to be a walk in the park due to having the opportunity to gain a few extra lives in advance on which to fall back and every area thereafter being, being the, the exact, exact opposite. opposite. In other words, an immeasurable goddamn mine rape from which there's no chance of snapping back and that they'll be wasted faster than lifetime supplies of Rolling Rock, Sapporo, Kirin Ichiban, and Jägermeister all rolled into one, mostly due to not only the never-ending onslaughts of goons and rivals that'll knock your ass a billion ways until Judgment Day, but also the time-consuming, nerve-wracking confrontations with those previously noted mini and end bosses whose names were in no position whatsoever to recap, with some select notable exceptions. For starters, I'm more than able to make Jack, Electra, and Farbon in Area 1, and if possible, some of their clones in later areas, except maybe the latter, and Vahilots near the end of Area 3, my forever bitch is worry-free. But everyone else can go fuck a refrigerator sideways while drowning in the Mediterranean Sea, trapped in an Iron Maiden singing Amy Winehouse songs in Klingon. I'm looking at you, Jed Samza, Abadede, Wayne and Vulture, and especially those goddamn oversized heavyweight boxers, R. Baron Bear Jr. I mean, seriously, how fucked up is it that each of these bosses tend to pull a fast one every now and then, regardless of your strategic approaches, thus gaining the upper fucking hand. Either way, they're not as unfair as many perceive them to be, apart from an obvious lack of environmental hazards compared to 1 and 3, rhyme not intended. Hence why there's a wide-ass margin for improvement as long as you're mindful enough of their own attack patterns, amongst many of the other pointers I've indicated earlier, which I'm also in no position to echo even at this point. The usual 3 lives and 3 continues stipulation applies here, though you're free to change your initial life stock in the options area beforehand, not to mention swap characters between every continuation. And did I forget to mention, you can nab more lives by scoring more points and finding the always rare 1-up icons? Graphically, holy fucking Christ, words can't express how blown away I am, and shit no I'm not exaggerating, about the immense pillar of effort-driven improvement the designers went out of their way to integrate within every key aspect of this game's presentation. The main quartet's appearances have been given an insanely massive facelift like never before, especially the newly introduced Max and Skate no less. Likewise for the opposing hostile parties despite the obvious palette swaps, except for Mr. X and Shiva, animation-wise and detail-wise that is, and I don't even need to repeat myself let alone yammer on any further regarding the ongoing stretches of backgrounds for each stage area, notwithstanding the same deal of improvements they've received in the process, most notably areas 2 and 3, with the ripple effect in the water's reflection near the end before facing Jet, akin to Vice Project Doom, and the almost Mode 7 esque rotation effects during the pirate themed attraction while confronting the ninjas, respectively, amongst many. Your thoughts on the music and sound M to follow? With Koshiro at the helm once again, this time with Motohiro Kawashima of Shinobi 2 and Batman Returns on Game Gear fame joining him. The usual hype-ass FM synthesized and dancehall club-inspired collection of themes leave absolutely nothing to be desired whatsoever and fit every key scene and or interim to a T, as many might expect thereby pissing non-stop all over the previous game's soundtrack by the size of a beluga whale's anus. In addition, the SFX, or sound effects if you will, have also been slightly improved in terms of when the opposing human characters take damage, turning out to be more organic than ever, and the voiceover soundbites possessing about the same effect, with the latter featuring special technique names called out when pulling them off, apart from the obvious death yells and groans, and I'd listen to these very carefully.
And as usual, before we continue on, take note of our top five songs displayed here, with some honorable mentions included deep below. And lastly, the replay value. Ranking a notch higher than its precursor on account of the plethora of much deserved tweaks about which, who could have guessed? I can't stress enough in conveying my innermost urgency, thus reminding everyone to refer back. And neither can yours truly for fuck's sake. Including a more organized character skill set. Yet another unforgettably hype as balls and slamming soundtrack. Not to mention the various challenges you're bound to face dependent on the difficulty mode. Minus the trolling aspect of the first offering, it's no secret that SOR 2 is a must play. No scratch that, must own and must ace in anyone's book. Therefore, you'd be off your motherfucking rocker to leave this much appreciated follow up out in the cold. Couldn't have said it any better myself. But we're not done yet, oh fuck no. Next up, Streets of Rage 1 and 2 for the Game Gear. Both direct ports of their original Genesis counterparts, developed for Sega by Biox, aka Japan System House, of Mega Man 2 on Game Boy fame, and both released 92 and 93 individually. While their respective premises are identical to their Genesis counterparts, about which we strongly suggest referring back whenever and however appropriate, the gameplay aspects are on about the same wavelength, if maybe a skosh lower. If you will, Matt Michael. They both function about the same way as in their Genesis counterparts, except Adam and Max have been nixed out of their individual rosters, cause limitations. And the stage-by-stage -stage layout has been reduced to virtually half of the originals, if slightly more than that with at least one new area and boss replacement introduced in 2, on which will be further deliberated. Control-wise, 1 and 2 are for attacking and jumping individually, in conjunction with the usual D-pad for basic movement. However, the police squad car summoning tactic is nixed completely from this port of SOR1. Ditto for the horizontal momentum mid-jump and the mid-grapple knee attacks. The blitz techniques and specials are back, executed as always by tapping left or right twice before 1, or hitting 1 and 2 simultaneously, with or without the D-pad's cooperation. Since both offerings are limited to 5 stages, identical to those from their 16-bit counterparts, the following are featured. The usual city streets, ending with boomerang expert Antonio, the under construction highway, originally stage 4 in the Genesis version, ending with that fat, fire-breathing fuckwad bongo, the cruise ship, originally stage 5 in the Genesis version, ending with the Green Blaze clones, Mona and Lisa, aka Yasha and Onihime. The Industrial Factory area of the Syndicate HQ, originally stage 6 in the Genesis version, this time ending with the return of the very same Bongo, and finally the HQ's Inner Sanctum, complete with all the usual boss rematches, with the former 3 before Mr. X. Whereas the second Streets of Rage features not only the same flashy urban exteriors and bar interior scenes, ending with knife-throwing Punk Jack, the sultry yet stealthy Dominatrix Electra, and black wife beater-clad Kempo Buff Barbon, 
but also the amusement park featuring both the return of Jet and the biker infested caves, followed by the same alien themed attraction ending with Zamza, minus Vahilets, and the Predator inspired extraterrestrial assassin. Underneath the bunker and atop of the deck of the same cruise ship, ending with Wayne and Heavyset Boxer Arbear, respectively. And lastly, the industrial factory and elevator shaft, followed by the lobby and building elevator areas of the Syndicate HQ, featuring not only the debut of those goddamn exploding droids, shit, Sonic anyone? But also the returning hopping battle droid duo Particle and Molecule, repeat confrontations with every previous boss before this particular point, which won't be fucking echoed, leading up to Shiva and Mr. X, meshed along with the usual waves of goons on which to open up one can of whoop ass after another. Compared to their original 16-bit relatives, however, not only is the AI annoying as all get-out, the controls are extremely stiff and crippled like Tiny Tim, resulting in the half-assed on-screen registration of every command, in which case you're better off tapping accordingly in the case of SOR1. But they are a skosh more responsive in 2, especially when it comes to pulling off any special while standing or in conjunction with left or right, depending on which character you're experimenting with. Overall, the gameplay framework is on approximately the same wavelength as their Genesis counterparts, if slightly lower. Who the hell would expect anything less, right? Anyways, care to voice your thoughts on the challenge? If you need to, feel free to refer back to what's been already deliberated on regarding the first two Genesis offerings on which these ports are based, since, yet again, I'm in no position to echo every detail. Remember when we were talking about SOR1, and I mentioned those stiff-ass controls and limited ability issues? These, along with how you approach every adversary, whether it's the common street goons, dominatrixes, area bosses, what have you, are amongst the common pet peeves that add to the difficulty. Thank God they were fixed in the sequel, however, with the slightly augmented scrolling speed in each area. Talk, Talk about, about night and day. day! Even so, there's no excuse not to keep a weather eye on what's ahead and who's out to make you their eternal bitch worthy of Jon Snow's charms. As always, starting off with 3 and any amount up to 5 lives in both entries respectively, and at least 3 continues, I wouldn't get too crestfallen should you happen to get unnecessarily roughed up worse than a left behind ragdoll taking into consideration the balanced, if extremely mind-raping, choice of difficulty levels. Graphics-wise, all the participating assets, specifically all the cutscenes, stage areas, opposing characters, whatever the Christ have us, are well represented here given the handheld's limited-ass capabilities, complete with its usual bevy of detail, notwithstanding the horrendous slowdown that occurs whenever there's more than two or three characters on the screen at a time. Of course, ditto for who could have motherfucking guessed the music and sound? Back me the fuck up, M Squared. Who else but Koshiro knew how to implement his iconic funk factor into all his melodic compositions, as they're also reincarnated directly from the original 16-bit parents, if at times inaccurately? And don't even get us started about the mediocre yet prudent sound effects either. Minus any voice samples. Yeah, that's what the fuck she said. Replay value-wise, despite how limited the control scheme is, and at times crippled, as well as the extreme trim-downs of extra content from the original console counterparts, and the obvious lack of testing and polishing prior to release, amongst the few of the downsides laid down so far, the Game Gear ports of Streets of Rage 1 and 2 are totally worth a thrill or two, no pun intended, in terms of kicking serious ass on the go, which we suggest not leaving out in the blistering ass cold if I were you. And if you're ballsy enough, there's even a simultaneous two-player mode that you can access if you've got duplicate copies of both offerings, another Game Gear on hand, and a link cable. Final exhibit, Streets of Rage 3.
Once again, continuing from where the previous installment left off, according to a recently written and delivered letter from Blaze, which of course Axel receives and reads off screen, not to mention news from one of the soon to be featured playable characters, Dr. Gilbert Zan, Mr. X has resurfaced once more with the intent of assigning identical robotic decoys of the police's top ranking officials in their place via his newly founded front company, RoboSci Corporation, and its faithful designer, Dr. Dom, under yet another in the series of his ironclad reigns. Like seriously, does that douchey ass bastard even know when the hell to quit or what? And to make matters even more fucked up, thanks to the recent disappearance of the police chief, specifically Blaze, Axel, and Adam's old superior, massive occurrences involving bomb explosions have been ongoing, thereby leaving the city preoccupied. Now, since Adam's out of the picture for the second time in a row, despite having been recently rescued, Skate returns to the scene, not only joining the aforementioned Dr. Zan, a former researcher from the very same RoboSci, I might add, but also the returning Blaze and, who could have guessed, Axel himself, and ceasing Mr. X's horseshit as fuck citywide terrorist activities. Regarding Bare Knuckle 3, its Japanese equivalent's premise, however, Wood Oak City, aka the very same nameless city within which this franchise has been taking place, I might add, has been wrecked to shit by a nuke made up of a radioactive element by the name of Rakushin, or according to other sources, Rakshin or Laxine, element number 122 that is, of which the very same, recently resurfaced for the third time in a row, Mr. X stole an insanely large quantity on top of shanghaiing a high-ranking superior, General Petrov, who, as it turns out, is strongly opposed to the use of this particular radioactive material and using the also-returning Shiva as his imposter to start an all-out war while smuggling the Rakushin, again aka Laxine, with which the Syndicate has made off. Who else but our aforementioned heroic quartet is capable and willing to stand up and cease all this catastrophic-as-fuck chaos, right? Superseding the same exciting, extreme, and endless beat-em-up brawl fest from its two foregoers, everyone's back with the same stats and techniques, except Max, as he's replaced by the earlier recounted, newly introduced Dr. Zan. In terms of the whole slow as molasses yet fights like a tank angle, with his jet boots, hydraulic arms, and Colossus-style force field, but with isn't it motherfucking obvious? Yet another slew of improvements this time around. First off, as expected, everyone can run by tapping left or right twice. Not just Skate, of course, as he's deemed to be a tad less reliable than before, thereby providing the game with a much faster pace, progression-wise. Not to mention tumble within or outside the stage's background planes by tapping up or down twice as a last-second dodging maneuver to avoid any unnecessary damage. Whenever the characters wield any of the returning weapons, you know, your standard knives, swords, you name it. Not only do they sport new maneuvers, depending on whom you're playing as, their gauge of usage is displayed, thus disappearing off-screen when expired. Fired, clash at Demon Head much? Except when using Xan, whose damage output leaves God knows how much to be desired, notwithstanding the surprisingly ample range his roster of techniques possess for the record. In which case, he'll transform them into energy orbs upon nabbing said weapons, but will result in the same pointless as fuck usage gauge effect. A meter for pulling off a character's special is included to the right of the health bar, which recovers every once in a while, but you still end up wasting health, if very little, compared to the previous outing. And the all-new Blitz level up system involves reaching a specific scoring interim without dying once, at which juncture a star is added per interim, to be precise, every 40,000 points, thereby advancing the dash range and attack power of your desired character and allowing you to pull off his or her maneuver, depending on how many stars you've gained. And don't think I'm not aware of the fact that this game supports the 6-button controller, in terms of the X, Y, and Z buttons granting you the abilities of executing said Blitz techniques in tandem with the random D-pad inputs, once again depending on your chosen character, their combo finishers, and back attacks, individually, either. Feature changes aside, including yet another stage itinerary setup, case in point, a warehouse followed by the pier and back alley areas, the customary neon-illuminated city streets, followed by a techno club and bar, a construction site rife with a returning bottomless pits, not to mention an auto-scrolling bulldozer trap with breakable concrete barriers and the freight elevator leading to the roof, an underground railway with cargo trains aplenty, eventually leading up to the three inner sanctum areas of Mr. X's new stronghold. Everything's almost ditto, except for one other downside, over which I've seen and heard many rage time and time again, no pun intended. It's infamous hair-raising difficulty level, Compared to those of not only this game's two previous relative offerings, but also its original Japanese counterpart, Bare Knuckle 3, which are the very least manageable for the record, the US and European releases have been unexpectedly yanked up far beyond its absolute goddamn limits, due to a myriad of hurdles which will be further touched on eventually. 
And to top even that off, the ending outcomes are dependent on which preset difficulty mode you're experimenting with. Shit, if at all. Konami Syndrome much? That aside, the controls are still responsive and bug-free as ever, notwithstanding how often you'll end up being easily demolished like a son of a bitch depending on your own instincts alone. Amongst those very same hurdles we've been addressing over and over, and will continue to do so by none other than, who could have guessed, the challenge. Expect yet another myriad of bullfuckery every step of the way, as most of what we've been shooting our pieholes off about so far should pretty much sum it all up. Aside from making every Herculean effort to survive every inconceivable ass onslaught of enemy assaults and environmental obstacles this game will throw at you each chance it gets, you'll notice right away how not only certain enemies can land one lucky combo after another like it's their god-given purposes before your opportunity to react arises. Case in point, the returning and newly styled gender-diversified punks, McBride and McCloud amongst the few, if many, hitmen you'll face off against, Bongo and his fire-breathing lard-ass dick-face squad, Storm's relentless-as-fuck bike gang, shirtless MMA warriors by the name of Fabio, no, not that Fabio, goddammit, Tiger and others, Chiba and his always intrepid ninja clan, and the XP-1 attack droids, but the bosses as well, the also-returning Shiva, whom not only you can play as by inputting a code upon his defeat, but reappears when you fuck up near the end, a kooky circus trainer clown by the name of Bruce, and his cocky kangaroo companion Rue, the latter of whom can also be unlocked as a playable character by 86 and the former, the also-returning Mona and Lisa, except roided as fuck, super sexy and supercharged like never before, a merciless robotic decoy of Axel, a trio of stealthy samurai scrotum suckers by the name of Yamato, the rocket pack toting Jet and his squadron, and finally, if your adventure's and ballsy enough, Robots X and Y, with the latter turning out to be the true form of Mr. X, prior to which you have to go up against Dr. Dominus' claw machine. Not to mention the fact that there's numerous winding paths leading to either the second and final confrontation with the not-dead-after-all Shiva, or the brooding Robot Y, as well as an opportunity to rescue the recently Shanghai police chief, which will result in a shitty outcome if you fail, by the way, depending on which of said winding paths you took within the stronghold, in conjunction with your preset difficulty mode, as long as it's not easy, obviously. And to top that off also, as strict as Ball's time limits imposed upon you during the last showdown against Robot Y, which when either wisely taken advantage of, or pointlessly wasted like a lifetime supply of PBR and Kirin Ichiban, will also affect the outcome in tandem with whether or not you save the police chief, so here's 10 bucks worth of free advice. Make every goddamn effort count! Oh, and kindly refer back to Streets of Rage 2 concerning the same set of stipulations and guidelines which also apply here, since I'm in absolutely no position to recap the ever-loving shit out of them. The graphics are nothing more than an obvious, yet extremely augmented change from its overhyped as hell previous outing, complete with a much darker and edgier theme than before, thanks entirely to the meticulous design and more detailed yet still awkward animations of all the main, supporting, and opposing characters alike, in-game and during the cutscenes no less. What's even more, not only have the urban and natural environments through which they stomp ass been provided with an undeniably well-deserved facelift, or in this particular case, a set lift. Serious consideration was also given to their appropriate background and foreground elements. For instance, who can forget the chains that rattle whenever someone hits the floor very fucking hard, let alone the sun's reflection from the ocean in Area 1, the illuminating club lights in the second half of Area 2, or the rumbling underground railroad tracks in Area 4, amongst other underlying features, right? It's no question that the designers knew what the hell they were doing when applying said visual changes, and then some. In terms of music and sound, however, with all due profuse respect to Koshiro and Kawashima's always indefatigable industrial and techno track arrangement efforts, and while many are better off looking the other way due to them being a rather divisive matter, I have no regrets stating that a certain fraction of the random sound generated tracks are at the very least suitable for fitting the game's overall dark theme, while the others just flat out leave Christ knows how much to be desired. And while we're at it, the same could be said for the usual batch of sound effects, including the usual digitized voice clips of every enemy getting their asses handed back to them on a bronze platter. Not to mention the newer, US and Europe exclusive samples of the main crime fighting quartet exhibiting their beyond compare techniques. And as ever, I'd listen to those very carefully if I were you. To be fair, however, my top 5 tracks are displayed below, with some select honorable mentions included, so I'd also get a good peek of those if I were you. This 
quality, due in part to the earlier recounted slew of features about which, once again, won't be echoed here to the brink of insanity, including the unlockable hidden characters, who are unable to wield any weapons while assuming their worlds, by the way, plus one in particular that can only be accessed upon inputting a game genie code, and notwithstanding how much the countless masses of fans and reviewers alike the world over prefer the second more than the others, I flat out low-key possess a true cast-iron belief that there hasn't been a better note to close out the series than with this often conflicted follow-up, that is until the true number four. Granted, the cons about which many have been constantly bitching time and time again could have benefited from more attention than what was initially applied, but for yours truly, the underlying pros far beyond outweigh the ever-loving fuck out of them. Call me demented as fuck, but I strongly suggest giving both this and its original Japanese counterpart, aka the aforementioned Bare Knuckle 3, a go. At least for the sake of both comparison and curiosity. <laughs> Henceforth, what's my final verdict on this series? Even following the debut of Capcom's Final Fight franchise in the arcades two years prior, I honestly wish there was more to express about this often remembered, yet at times forgotten franchise that, uh, I don't know, hasn't already been expressed god knows how many times over. Rife with memorable characters, a straightforward, albeit sometimes convoluted plotline, gameplay framework, control schematics, and varying levels of difficulty rolled into each offering, not to mention a range of decrepit to vivid graphics, and an iconic, upbeat, melodic soundtrack. There's no way up the ass of South Park's Mr. Slave one would ever go wrong with Sega's Streets of Rage, so please, take my strong sound advice, or don't. Stick with the first couple of offerings and their respective handheld ports, if at all possible. But whatever you do, avoid the third offering like a goddamn Category 5 Storm, <laughs> just fucking with ya. On a scale of 1 to 10, here's how I rate them all. Even as ever, taking these statistics into account, you'd be non-motherfucking compass mentis to miss out further on what true 90s ass-kicking was all about. They're also available in numerous collections and for various modern consoles as well. And for those that haven't scoped out the recently released Streets of Rage 4 on the PS4 and Switch, amongst numerous other consoles today, I strongly suggest doing so. And now I mean just viewing the trailer, oh shit no. Anyways, until then, this- Oh my god, how could I possibly forget? Before I go, I'd like to take this opportunity and thank the two Matts, Lester and Stone, from Dover, New Hampshire, husband of Becky, and Clovis, California, husband of Sarah, respectively, for once again rolling through with yours truly on yet another unforgettable memory lane trip. Cue the applause. Yeah, 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 wonderful. Until then, considering how great it is to be back after close to half a year, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God triumphantly signing off.